by Ian Plymer. I just can't wait to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> but just in case any of you have to leave early, here is my message. I hope that's clear. <laughs> now, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to hear somebody in an Australian accent introducing the Viscount Monkton of Brinchley. <laughs> Because in Scotland, there's a rather unfortunate accident that happens when they pronounce my title. Will yous welcome the vacant Moncton? <laughs> so the vacant Moncton is really pleased to be here among you all today. And I do need to thank a lot of people who have made it possible before I do anything else. I want to thank Alan Jones for bringing his fan club here today. Now, I first came across uh, Alan when he was very kind enough to allow me to go on his wonderful coast-to-coast, 70 stations radio network to talk about the Copenhagen Treaty, which I'll be talking about a bit later on tonight. And uh, the coverage from Australia was extraordinary. I had emails from all over the place. And so when he said he was going to bring his fan club with him tonight, and here you all are, I was thrilled. <laughs> But I also want to thank Professor Plymer for his very generous introduction to congratulate him on the enormous success on three continents of his excellent book, Heaven and Earth. If you haven't got a copy yet, it is on sale un outside at a very unreasonable price. Uh, and I'm particularly honoured that I should be allowed to follow and be introduced by one of the most distinguished scholars and professors in the field of climate today. So you really have done me a favour by being here, and I thank you. I also, I also want to thank very much two retired engineers from Noosa who dug deep into their own pockets, putting their houses even on the line, so that I could come here to talk to you today in Australia. And that's John Smead and Kay Smith. I want to hear very loud noises. <laughs> These two gallant gentlemen love their country. They were frightened at what they heard that might happen if this ETS scheme went through. They decided the best way to do something about it was to recruit help from eminent professors and from not-so-eminent shop-worn peers of the realm. <laughs> and they decided that even if nobody else would pay, they would pay whatever it cost to get me here. Now, I didn't hear a loud enough appreciation for that, so let's do it properly. <laughs> Now, you know what it is with engineers. Everybody tells jokes about them, and I'm no exception. As you know, uh, one of these two engineers was with Kevin Rudd recently. Uh, I won't say which engineer, and I won't say which Kevin Rudd, um, <laughs> in a bordello. And they were talking over a drink, as one does, with one of the ladies of the night. And they were discussing among themselves which was the oldest profession. And the lady of the night said, well, of course, everybody knows. Mine is the oldest profession. And then the engineer said, well, no, because God created order out of chaos, and that was an engineering feat. <laughs> and then Kevin Rudd smiled, that wonderful smile that he has, and he said, and who do you think created the chaos? And finally, I do also want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. Because just by your presence, you have made it noticed that we will not tolerate lies anymore. No more bogus statistics. No more bent graphs. 
No more made-up result. No more global warming profiteering by the big guy at the expense of the little guy. Those days are over. Today, here, we draw a line in the sand. <laughs> With the help of a spade. Not quite sure what that's doing there, but anyway, as you may know, the Intergovernmental Panel of the UN on Climate Change, which has produced four major assessment reports, doesn't do simple. It doesn't call a spade a spade. Nope, it calls it a one-person operated, manually controlled, foot-powered implement of simple and robust yet adequately efficacious lignometallic composition designated primarily, though by no means exclusively, for the utilisation on the part of hourly paid operatives deployed in the agricultural, horticultural or constructional trades or industries, <laughs> as the case may be, for purposes of carrying out such excavational tasks or duties as may from time to time be designated by supervisory grades as being necessary, desirable, expedient, apposite or germane with regard to the ongoing furtherance of the task or objective in hand or on the other hand, underfoot, Secretary General. <laughs> now, I'm not going to talk gobbledygook like that tonight much. We're going to start with something really simple that I put together for a, a presentation to Bill Clinton. Um, and... Um, for some people, you have to make things really rather simple. And so what this slide uh, demonstrates is that, of course, there has been warming, exactly as Ian Plymer said, for 300 years since the end of the Little Ice Age, and that that 300 years of warming is almost entirely natural on any view. And where would you expect the warmest years of that 300 years to be after 300 years of warming, anyone? Yes, at the end of the period. So when you hear people saying, ooh, it's the warmest decade in the last 150 years, actually it's the warmest decade in 300 years, which is exactly what you'd expect after 300 years of warming. <laughs> so that, that slide, in fact, makes a very sensible, straightforward point. And it was sent to me by Professor M. I. Bhatt of the Indian Geological Survey. Now, this is the guy who has been telling me for years that the rubbish in the UN's 2007 report about glaciers disappearing by 2035 has absolutely no basis in reality. He knows all these glaciers, glaciers by name. I, I tried to catch him out. I said, come on, Professor Bat, what about Gangotri then? What about Wrongbook then? And he said, Wrongbook, yup, major geological disturbance locally, which swallowed up the glacier from beneath. I said, what about Gangotri? He said, that one's been receding too, but it's been receding since 1820, I think. And he said the recent rate of recession has been accelerated again by local geological disturbances. Otherwise, there's nothing wrong with the glaciers of the Himalayas at all. He said, we've got 200 years of records. And I've therefore been passing this information out. And now, finally, literally last week, knowing that I was coming here, the UN decided it had better admit the truth. Now, I also want to make another point clear, which we need to establish right at the beginning. The fact of warming does not tell us why the warming is happening. So the fact that there's been 300 years of warming, during at least 270 of which we could not on any view have had anything to do with it, does not mean that we were the cause of the warming of the last 20 or 30 years. And we're going to see a bit more about that later. The warming could, as you see here, have been caused by Al Gore with a flamethrower on the top of the Greenland ice sheet. <laughs> now, another uh, rather simple point we need to make clear. Just because we have CO2 increasing, and just because we also have temperature increasing, doesn't mean the one causes the other. Correlation, as we boffins put it, need not imply causation. And to demonstrate this, I've plotted here the number of Republican senators in the upper house of the US Congress against sunspot numbers. <laughs> and those of you who are of a generally conservative or liberal or national party disposition, um, rather like the Republicans over there, will no doubt be delighted to know that the more sunshine there is, the more Republican senators there are. <laughs> Now, this is a most important and significant climatological result. 
Now, 